Okay. So our our first panel for today uh, is a panel on practicing patent law after the AIA. Uh, the moderator for this panel is Mike Pegues. Mike is a shareholder at Possinelli PC. He's also the vice chair of the intellectual property and litigation practice there. Mike has over 25 years of patent litigation experience at the district court and appellate level. Uh, he has a uh, degree in mechanical engineering from SMU and is a graduate of Tulane University Law School. After graduating from law school, Mike was a judicial law clerk for the Honorable Richard Schell of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, he and his uh, panelists have put together a wonderful panel for us today. And so Mike, I'm going to now turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor Robinson. On September 16, 2011, the landscape of the patent world changed forever because this is the date on which Senator Patrick Leahy, the then uh, head of the Senate Intellectual Property Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee, America Invents Act became law. President Obama stated that this long overdue reform is vital to our ongoing efforts to modernize America's patent laws. The changes mostly harmonize U.S. patent law with the rest of the world by converting the United States to a first to file country as opposed to a first to invent. But it also created the Patent Trial and Appeals Board or PTAB. Inter partage review or IPRs, covered business methods, CBM, post grant reviews, PGRs, best mode curing capabilities, and s and &E filings and markings, et cetera. We are here today to discuss the uh, life before the AIA, life post enactment of the AIA, and what does the future look like given the return of Senator Leahy to the head of the Senate Intellectual Property Subcommittee. We have with us today on our panel, Nate St. Clair. Nate is an equity partner at Jackson Walker LLP and has significant experience in advising clients in complex business and intellectual property matters. He is a registered patent attorney and has counseled, uh, has been counsel of record in over 60 plus IP litigation matters, drafted and prosecuted over 150 patent applications and is counsel of record on thousands of trademark matters. We also have Amir Hawk. Amir is the Vice President and Assistant General Counsel at Hewitt Packard Enterprises and serves as the Chief Patent Counsel for HP. In this role, Amir leads a team of attorneys and agents handling worldwide patent prosecution preparation and portfolio management. Prior to joining HPE, Amir spent several years at Foley and Lardner in Washington, DC, where he primarily focused on patent preparation and prosecution in the electrical arts. Prior to the firm, Amir worked as a patent examiner at the PTO, focusing on telecommunication technologies. We also have Angela Oliver. Angela is an appellate and intellectual property attorney at Haynes and Boone, who regularly appears in inter partes review proceedings before the PTO. She is also experienced in patent litigation matters and she previously prosecuted patent applications in a variety of fields. Prior to joining Haynes and Boone, Angela served as a law clerk to Chief Judge Prost of the Federal Circuit and to now Chief Judge Rodney Gilstrap of the Eastern District of Texas. And before we get our program started, I wanted to remind everyone that at the bottom of your screen, in place of what we have come to know as the chat function, there's a Q&A section. If you have any questions as we go through the program, enter your questions there and we will try to answer them uh, as we transition from section to section during the uh, Q&A portion of our program. So during the pre-AIA enactment period, Nate, you were working as outside counsel. What were some of your concerns about the AIA prior to its enactment? Good morning and thank you, Mike. Um, at least two concerns immediately come to mind. Uh, first would be the uh, transition from what we knew as inter partes re-examination to uh, the new procedure at the time, uh, which converted to inter partes review. 
the second was the first to invent versus first to file. Uh, I'll talk about both of them briefly. Um, looking back, you know, although both processes involve uh, determinations of novelty and non-obviousness, um, the, the issue for me at the time or the concern for me was that re-examinations were uh, held before examiners, a core group of examiners having um, skill in a particular art area. And we were transitioning uh, with the new act, with the AIA to the IPR procedure, which were set before a group of administrative law judges. Um, so at the time, there's a little bit of anxiety. Um, and, and I should also say my, my practice was a mix of both prosecution and litigation at the time is more litigation now, but there was a bit of anxiety on how that would affect the outcome of cases, particularly in uh, high technology cases, those in the electronic arts. Um, you know, also um, this would, this created a transition internally within a lot of firms because it would take the file, particularly from the hands of a prosecutor to the hands of a litigator or quasi litigator to some degree, because the IPR process converted from being more of a uh, prosecutorial process to a minor or small litigation process. Um, this, was, th th this was a little disconcerting at the time and it took a, a lot of adjustments to get to post AI. The other part being first to invent, first to file, um, because we had practiced under um, the first to invent practice for so long, uh, we developed cultures within some, many of our larger clients that, you know, maintaining your records, uh, maintaining your data books to show uh, when this idea was developed and when it was enabled over time was enough. Now moving forward, knowing that we have to act a little quicker and file as soon as practical. So that was a little bit of a transition, but uh, that was where our, our heads were largely and the concerns were pre-AIA. Amir, you were in-house at the time at HPE. What were uh, some of your concerns um, as an in-house counsel prior to AIA being enacted? Sure. So hello, Mike, and good morning, everyone. So Nate, Nate touched on a number of them, but you know there was a lot that everything was a concern because it was such a big change. Um, but if I had to name a few of the key areas, you know, 102, obviously the changes there, going to a conditional grace period, having the effective filing date being triggered off of uh, the filing and not the invention, the expanded scope of prior art. Those were all things that uh, we wanted to wrap our head around. Uh, beyond that, I would say we were concerned about third party submissions and whether this would become commonplace going forward. Um, and then covered business methods was another area. We had concern that the definition of financial services might end up being too broad and the technical exceptions um, exception might be too narrow. And therefore cases that were not intended to be pulled in would get pulled in. Um, as more of a practical matter internally, we were focused on clearing the backlog. That was a concern. And we definitely wanted to dance with the devil we knew. And it was important for us to try to file, and we made a concerted effort to try to file as much as we could pre-AIA. And it wasn't just that, we also were thinking about uh, counterpart cases. So if we were having a continuation filed you know, post 2013, we'd prefer it to all be uh, considered under pre-AIA law. And we were worried about having split families where you know the parent is pre-AIA, the child is post-AIA. So we definitely went through lengths to try to make sure we uh, didn't have these sort of split families. So those were definitely some, some concerns if I look back 10 years ago. Well, I agree with both of you guys looking back over the last 10 years prior to the enactment of AIA and waiting for it to to take effect, there was some anxiety associated with it. But, you know, even though there was uh, there were concerns about a number of different provisions, everyone seemed to talk about first to file. So Amir is an in-house counsel for HP with patents all over the world. Was first to file even a uh, a concern, a, uh, a bleep on you, you all's radar? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's yes and no. I mean, we did have good processes and we did definitely file early and often. So for most, most cases, this wasn't an issue. We were filing before this would have been an issue. I'd say that said, we also at the same time, you know, we're a U.S. company and the U.S. case was the most important case. And that's where we started. After that, only a subset would be filed in foreign jurisdictions. So we did have a group of inventors who were aware that there is this grace period and we can rely on our lab notebooks. And yeah, we might lose our foreign rights, but it's okay, we'll, we'll still get the main one that matters, that's the US case. And for this group of inventors that were, let's say, you know, raised in the first two invent system, we had to go through lengths to explain to them that this is a, we're switching to a first to file system. We do not want to rely on this grace period. Um, even it's, it's more, um, it's different than the past and therefore it is a race to the patent office. So we had to definitely impress upon urgency on our inventors and let them know that it's, it's really a race to the patent office. And even though we've been filing early, let's do it even better. Now, Amir, that's a phrase I haven't heard in a long time, uh, in probably 10 years, and that's race to the patent office. We used to hear that a lot, uh, back in, uh, 2011. Now, Nate, you represented both large clients and, and smaller clients, some solo, some small, small companies. How did First to File impact those entities? Um, so for many of them, particularly the large ones, I'll start there. Um, they wanted to, to take uh, the, the process that Amir mentioned, and they wanted to rush and file to get as much as they could um, on file pre-AIA. Um, and you know, thinking about it, it it's, it's a lot similar to what happened, you know, I would say 15 years before that in June, uh, June 8th of 1995, where uh, a lot of large companies wanted to rush to file to be a part of the earlier priority rules, um, as opposed to filing after June 8th, 1995. So that was fairly consistent with what we expected. Many of them wanted to file and get as much on file as they could. Um, but for many of our larger clients, they already had adopted the practice that Amir mentioned is filing as soon as it was practical to do so. Um, they had regimented procedures for having invention disclosure forms internally, a process for vetting. Uh, once things were, you know, air quote approved within the organization for filing, and they did it as soon as possible. Um, they, you know, on occasion rely on uh, the lab notebooks, you know, if, if we had a contentious issue amongst the competitor, but, but that was, those were the rare cases. Um, the advice to them was just being prepared to file as soon as practical to do so. And if we were, you know, as, as we continue to advise them, if we think we're close as far as the development, but there may be still more to come, um, we've continued to advise them to just file provisionals. And as the time comes and we're ready, you know, we'll take the bigger step in filing the utility. The, the change really was for the smaller companies and smaller clients that knew the law um, and their inventors that were prolific inventors that understood that they had a window or somewhat of a runway that if they kept good notes that they could file when they wanted to file. And we had to introduce a cultural change and you know, explaining to them, this is one of many changes in the law, but for you guys, this might be one of the most important and here's why. And you know, many of them who didn't do foreign filings were just completely unaware that the rest of the world operated in this way. So after that brief introduction, I think many of them just realized that they didn't have the cushion as far as time to sit back and, and take time to, to further develop and further develop. I'll say what we noticed is that it enhanced efficiency for a lot of our smaller clients because they knew they had their feet to the fire and that their neighbor or another inventor down the street might have a similar ideal and they just can rely on the lab notebooks uh, through perpetuity in the same way that they had been mentally cultured to think. So those were, those were two different major changes between the smaller and the larger, but it, it didn't take long for the smaller ones to jump on board. Well, we've talked a little bit about what your concerns were pre-AIA and then anxieties and how you uh, advise your clients. If you knew now if you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently in preparation for the enactment of AIA? And I'll start with, uh, yeah, go ahead, Nate. Sure. Um, well, like most fears, 
um, they they don't quite become as realized as you know we we might have thought they were at the time, and a lot of it is just not having um, that experience for things to play out. Uh, in hindsight, you know we've come to learn that many of our legal fears and anxieties just didn't present themselves in the way that we thought they would. Um, that could be the result of intense preparation, or it could just be the result of this: the things just didn't play out as we had overly imagined that they would. Um, but looking back, one of the things that, that I, I did learn in the first, say, full year of, um, of the AIA being enacted is, um, in, in most cases, when you're representing large companies, say, like the size of Amir's company, um, and, and they're suing the defense, they're, they're suing the patent litigation matter on the defense, uh, the, one of the first thoughts is invalidity. And we look at what our case is for invalidity and also non-infringement. Well, with this new tool, the IPR, we had to consider uh, whether or not we assert invalidity in the patent litigation as an affirmative defense and as a counterclaim, or whether or not we held that because we were making a strategic decision to throw the patent into inter partes review. That was a consideration we didn't have to make before. It was all in, it's all in the complaint, we had reasonable basis to do so. And that was a strategic consideration that was one that we had to learn very quickly, you know, the first time a major client was sued and make a strategic determination. And that rolled into our counseling going forward for the next 10 years. So uh, Nate, I will just assume that it was intense preparation that uh, uh, calmed your nerves and your feelings <laughs> over the years. But Amir, if, if you knew then what you do know now, what would you have done differently within HPE? Yeah, if I um, think about the, on the inventor side, I think we got that right. I think spending the time with the inventors and, and bringing them up to speed and getting them to add more urgency to an already urgent matter, we got that right. But if I think more of within our organization, probably you know looking back about what we were worried about that really didn't materialize, it was similar to what Nate said, a lot of preparation, but a lot of things didn't materialize. Like I mentioned, the, the CBM, Fear that it would pull in a bunch of our cases didn't materialize. The idea that third-party submissions were going to take off and become commonplace in half our cases didn't materialize. Um, some of the concerns about 102 and some of the fact patterns that you'd see on the blogs and so forth, they were just very narrow um, hypotheticals that really, really didn't become a, a worry for us. Um, IPRs obviously took off, as, as, as Nate mentioned, and that was probably one of the biggest pieces of the AIA, AIA that um, came about. Um, and if I look, think about the last 10 years, it really wasn't the AIA that had the biggest impact on us. Honestly, it was, you know, 101 with Alice, 112 with Williamson that, um, you know, were really some, some game changers for us or at least kept us occupied over the last 10 years. Well, now let's talk about post enactment of of the AIA. The enactment brought with it the regional patent offices, the PTAB, as we mentioned, best mode, SNE filing, CBM, PGRs, new definitions of prior art, third party submissions, supplemental examinations, virtual markings, among other things. If you could put your finger on one thing, the single most useful aspect of the AIA with respect to patent prosecution, what would that be, Amir? Yeah, this one might surprise folks, but what's been very helpful from my perspective is actually some of the more friendly procedural changes. Um, you know, I think the AIA acknowledged that a lot of institutions um, gain their rights by assignments from the inventor and being able to have the applicant be the assignee and lowering the burden on substitute statements, for example, has had a, a quite a big impact on when you have a large practice with a lot of cases and you have inventors that, you know, they, they with the company, sometimes they leave the company. It's hard to track them down. Sometimes they pass away for numerous reasons. It was always, you know, you always had this difficulty of getting a hold of inventors to sign things. And the fact that the AIA reduced that burden and let assinees be applicants was, was really, really nice. And I know you asked for one area, but another area that I like having in the toolkit is the track one cases. Um, it's not like we do it 
on often, but it's really nice in certain circumstances to have the ability to file a track one case. Um, and we've used that and I like that the AI introduced that and um, it's been pretty effective in the cases we've done it. Well guys, something has popped up in the uh, question and answer section, which we anticipated. It has absolutely nothing to do with the AIA, but it's why we haven't asked Angela any questions. <laughs> And we talked about this, but I, I, I will say this. Now, Angela, when you started practicing law, it was right at the time that AIA when it was enacted. So you had to study for the bar and learn both areas, right? Pre and post. Now, some people would say that that was patently unfair. <laughs> yeah. That was... <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but... You know, as, as, as you have been practicing within the AIA, what do you consider the single most useful portion of this uh, America Invents Act? Yeah, so for me, I would say it's definitely the IPRs. I, I think that's, that's made a huge change in litigation and how we think about strategy going forward. How about you, Nate? Uh, for me, it's, just, it's hands down IPR. Um, the IPR and CBM as well. Uh, for our clients, we do a lot of work in financial services as well, representing a lot of banks. Uh, many of them are not as heavy in patent prosecution as they were uh, right prior to the AIA and subsequent there too, but they've had to maintain a certain stream of patent prosecution, uh, and many of them have been subject to, to CBM and others to IPR, and uh, that has kept a lot of people busy, and I can definitely say that was probably the single most useful portion um, as we've seen the last 10 years pass. Now, uh, Angela, prior to AIA, there was a lot of talk as we were preparing for it that this third party submission during prosecution would be useful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you used or advised uh, any of your clients to use the third party submission process? You know, I actually considered it recently um, for the first time, um, but ultimately decided with a different course of action. Um, but, you know, like Amir was saying earlier, it's just not something that's taken off, um, you know, like a lot of people had anticipated. And so I, I have not had occasion to use it yet. Now, Amir, why do you think it hasn't taken off? Because I thought that it would be uh, particularly useful. I haven't used it, but what are some of the reasons you think it hasn't taken off? Yeah, um... We haven't seen it in a lot of our cases like we thought we would. And one of the reasons I think is folks are trying to weigh whether I wanna put this prior R and what's the likelihood the examiner is gonna look at it, look at it closely and really take what I'm saying um, seriously and, and apply it the way I, I think about it um, versus using his, the, his or her own prior art. And there's a risk that if it gets overlooked, it's gonna end up on the front of the patent and now it's a, it's a patent that's been considered. So I think that's something uh, some folks are considering, whether to actually submit it and let it end up on the front of a patent first hold on to it. Um, that said, I still think it's a useful, you know, for certain clients and certain situations, I think it's a cost effective procedure that uh, should be used more often, frankly. Nate, in your practice in, in litigation, did you ever consider the third party submissions to, you know, a, an effective cost effective means by which to limit some claims or, or maybe result in a patent not uh, issue? Uh, the first couple of years post enactment, we did. Um, we never used it as a practical tool. Um, I, I'll say to kind of add on to what, what Angela said, we, we always considered it the first few years and uh, just never moved forward with it as a tool because there were other tools we employed. What was interesting from a litigation standpoint is I recall in many cases where we had a large client that was sued by a non-practicing entity uh, or they had sued several parties uh, in you know, several cases across the country. I recall the day of, and this happened several times, where we would receive anonymous prior art from third parties that they would like mail to our office because of whatever level of angst or hate that they had against this particular non-practicing entity. Um, and a lot of times it, it might be good prior art, but we'd have stuff duplicative already that we are planning to use in a case. And, uh, but it's interesting because, because of that, I thought post AIA that we would see more third party type submissions uh, and see it used more often. And we haven't, and I'm kind of surprised that we haven't, but 
uh, it hasn't taken um, taken along the strength that we expected it to. Okay, now Amir, you mentioned a little bit about the prior art provisions in the AIA. Um, you know, foreign public use and offers for sale are considered prior art under the AIA, whereas previously use and sale of the invention by third parties abroad were not bars to patent uh, protection in the United States. Uh, has this change in the definition of prior art impacted the advice that you give your clients at HPE? I mean, certainly, yes. We advise them that the scope of prior art has expanded, and these are activities you have to be aware of that will now be considered prior art. Um, so yes, in that sense, in terms of our counseling, but as a practical matter, the impact it's made, I would say it it hasn't uh, been been a big issue. It hasn't come up too much. You know, it's the fact pattern for us at least that you're going to have some sort of that foreign commercialization before the U.S. just typically doesn't happen for us. And then I've also noticed in the you know, examiners haven't been, uh, it's generally not the type of prior art that's being cited by the PTO from what I'm seeing. So it's something you have to counsel on. They should be aware of it. But um, as a practical matter, it hasn't had too, too big of an impact on, on what I've seen going through. Okay, so Angela, with the, with the IPRs, let's, let's talk about post-grant review for a second. And PGR has added a procedure in which a third party may file a petition to cancel one or more claims within a nine month period of the issue or reissue. Have you used or, or witnessed the use of this provision to counsel claims in litigation or non-litigation matters? Yeah, so I've been involved in a, in a couple different PGRs. Um, the, the interesting thing about PGR compared to IPR, of course, is that in a PGR, you're allowed to raise uh, 112 invalidity issues as well as section 101 invalidity issues. Um, so that opens up a much larger discussion of invalidity before the board, it gives everyone a lot more options. Um, and of course, it raises the interesting questions about the board's section 101 guidance versus Supreme Court and Federal Circuit precedent on section 101. Um, but, you know, ultimately, PGRs are limited to the, those first nine months after patent issues. So, you know, they're few and far between. How about you, Nate? Any, um, any uses for you with, uh, with PGRs, particularly if a patent is uh, recently issued and your client gets a cease and desist letter? Yeah, uh, Mike, PGRs are often discussed from a, you know, kind of strategic and anecdotal standpoint but rarely used uh, for us just due to the time limitation. Uh, from the defense side, and that, that's largely who we represent from a defense side, our clients are not often um, the first targets for new patents, new patent holders. A lot of, uh, in, in most cases, our clients end up being in the later rounds of, of patent litigation and lets us truly a competitor to competitor matter. And in those cases, we likely have competing prior art um, and end in, some other form of cross licensing relationship. So that's that's very rare in that latter set of cases. But in most cases for our clients, we're just never in that first round of, of patent litigation where um, we have uh, patent patentees and plaintiffs that are that confident in going against you know a particular defense side client in the first nine months. Yeah, I'd have to agree with both you and Angela. While it's been considered during my practice over the last 30 years or so, we, well, over the last 20 years, 10 years, we, we, we haven't, uh, we haven't employed it. But Amir, the, the grace period, in a market departure from the old law, a third party disclosure made less than a year before the anticipated filing date is not prior art. If the subject matter of the disclosure was directly or indirectly disclosed by the inventor. So in a case where the inventor discloses something to a third party less than a year before the filing date and the third party subsequently discloses it, the same subject matter publicly, the third party disclosure is not prior art, unless, of course, the third party disclosure is not the same as the subject matter obtained from the inventor. Have, have, have you found this to be an issue uh, in your prosecution matters? Because this yeah. is the AIA. Yeah, this was talked about a lot. I mean, obviously we're emphasizing that the grace period is something we don't want to rely on. It's, there is a grace period, before it went from, well, there's a grace period to now there's likely a grace period, but we don't want to rely on it. And with regard to third-party disclosures, you know, I think 
pre-AIA or right when AIA came out, there was a lot on the blogs about this fact pattern that you would have uh, a third party, you disclose something to a third party, and then they would disclose your invention, but not your exact invention, something slightly different, and it would become prior art. And you know, I think it was it, it was interesting um, to in, in the blogs and so forth, but it really hasn't uh, materialized into into an issue for us. Um, that said, maybe it hasn't materialized because we really tried not to rely on the grace period and um, try to emphasize that to the to the inventors. I don't mean to ignore the recovering patent prosecutors in Nate and Angelo with these uh, questions on grace periods and and uh, the uh, prior That's art. Okay. If you guys have something you want to add, please do. Feel free to stick with the expert in Amir. Okay. I second okay. that. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, IPRs. The AIA now allows a third party to file a petition with the PTAP nine months or more after the issue, reissue date, or the conclusion of a PGR. Uh, it cannot be filed, however, more than one year after the petitioner is sued for infringement. The uh, So... Nate, how has that played in your litigation strategy or has it at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's a key component to, um, you know, whether we see, receive a cease and desist, um, whether or not we know that a competitor is working on, you know, related technology. And even from the offensive side, you know, many of our smaller inventors who have great technology, um, we know if we go for a behemoth, um, defended that our patents are going to be thrown into IPR. We, we've taken certain strategy um, in order to kind of create our own version of a challenge of our own patents. Sometimes we throw patents into reissue just to see whether or not um, it can stand up against uh, an examiner the same way it did the first time, hoping we get a different examiner providing you know, prior art that we've become aware of that, you know, was not duplicative of things that were before the examiner. Uh, other times we throw it into ex parte re-examination um, because we know that, you know, we want the art, we want the, the patent to be fortified to some degree if we're going to take an offensive approach because of that looming fear of knowing that your patents will be thrown into IPR. Those same strategies, we use the inverse or converse uh, when we're on the defense side as well, knowing that some plaintiffs might think like we do. So they go after smaller fish uh, in order to fortify, or they may you know, um, throw in an older patent that's kind of been through the ringer a little bit. But we take that into consideration largely because we know we got a, typically a one year window um, to file the IPR if we want to see true traction. Hey, Angela, a question just popped up, and that's what's the timeline of throwing a patent into IPR prior to going after a big behemoth? Um, you mean from the defense perspective, I, I assume, um, is what the question's referring to. Um, so, so, I mean, I think, you know, the timing of when to file an IPR now ha has changed. There, there's considerations now that we didn't have, you know, even three years ago with respect to the timing of IPRs. So obviously the statute has stayed the same. Um, you have to file an IPR within, you know, one, one year of being served with a complaint. Um, but in the past year and a half or so, we've really seen an increase in the discretionary denials from the board. Um, and that's particularly based on some guidance regarding um, some guidance known as NHK Spring and Fintiv um, that has to do with the timing of when the case will go to trial in district court. Um, and there's been a lot of guidance about that, a lot of discussion about that. There's been APA lawsuits filed about this guidance. Um, but it's resulted in a significant number of denials uh, based purely on the board's discretion. So with that in mind, um, you know, one of the considerations is you need to consider filing these IPRs very quickly. Um, as soon as you've been sued, um, even though you technically have a year under the statute, practically speaking, if you want your case instituted, you need to be thinking of that much earlier on. Now, Angela, we still have the old process of uh, ex parte re-exam. Do you uh, continue to use that in your practice? You know, sometimes. Um, and, you know, there are instances where it makes sense to do that. Um, but, of course, it doesn't have the same kind of statutory deadlines as the IPRs do from the board's perspective. So um, the efficiency and kind of quick decision you can get from the board 
um, in an IPR context, you know, you, you can't have that same uh, fast result necessarily in an ex parte re exam, but there's certainly still contexts where they're useful. Absolutely. You view that the same way, Nate? Absolutely. Um, we have used uh, ex parte re exams. Uh, and partly what I'll say, you know, most of our litigation teams are always supported by like true core patent prosecutors. Um, while they might not be, you know, first or second chair in the litigation, they're definitely uh, directly involved in all strategy related decisions. Uh, in some cases, when we, you know, might not see an IPR going a particular way, or we might uh, be too close to a deadline to get out the type of IPR petition that we'd be comfortable with filing, um, we strategically pull the ex parte reexamination arrow out of the quiver and employ that. And we've successfully employed it, at, particularly in cases that we've had on the East Coast uh, in Judge Stark's court uh, up in Delaware, where you know, we we didn't have the opportunity to do what we wanted to do with an IPR, but we got the patent, you know, essentially killed or the claims that affected us killed uh, in ex parte re-exam while in the midst of litigation. Problem with that is as the litigation speed to trial has been ticking back up, um, you run into some of the issues that Angela talked about because you may not be able to get the result that you want from the court examiner in the ex parte re-examination uh, if you're in one of the jurisdictions that moves a little quicker. So Amir, as a in-house counsel, you're uh, taking advice from folks like Nate and Angelo and IPRs and uh, ex parte uh, re-exams. How is that evaluated within your group, those, those two provisions? And do you like to use IPRs strategically? Yeah, I mean, generally that's handled handled by our IP litigation group, which is separate. But I will say, from what I'm seeing, IPRs are definitely something that are employed. It's a you know a great defensive tactic. It's something when we are offensive. It's something we need to think about. Um, but you know, we're a net defendant, and so IPRs are heavily used. Now, what I've also seen is things have evolved over the last you know ten years. And I think to Angela's point, you know, things have things have changed a bit in terms of the effectiveness and the likelihood of success. And there's just more factors to think about, I think, than than there were in the past. Um, but it's still definitely a, a key strategic uh, quiver, as Nate said, that we are um, uh, that we we utilize often. Now, Angela, as an IPR expert. I know you've heard the phrase that, uh, or you've heard that the PTAB has a reputation of uh, killing patents. And uh, do you think that uh, given this administration's um, leniencies towards uh, this, this reputation that it will continue over the next four years? Or, or do you see the, the prior administration tried to protect patents a bit? Uh, so where do you think that balance is going to be stricken uh, during this administration? Yeah, so, you know, it remains to be seen what will happen, you know, with a, a new patent office director and new guidance and things like that. But I think that reputation that you mentioned that the board has, has decreased a little bit, um, in part because of some other guidance that the board has. For example, I'm thinking of not just the discretionary denials based on uh, litigation timing, but the discretionary denials based on successive IPRs or follow on IPRs on the same patent. So, you know, where back in the day we used to see maybe five or six IPRs all challenging the same patent, you don't typically see that now. Um, typically, you'll get one or maybe two IPRs with respect to the same patent um, based again on this discretionary uh, denial, but kind of a different flavor of it. You know, we don't need to challenge the same patent six times. Um, so I think that that's kind of shifted the board's reputation a bit, just because um, there's a bit more of a balance, I, I think, overall there. Okay, Nate, we did have a question that popped up on the uh, on the timeline. It says, following up on the IPR timeline question, do you file the IPR a day, week, month, et cetera, prior to sending a cease and desist letter to the behemoth? Now, is this... So th this is the plaintiff sending a cease and desist letter. And is the question asking who, who's filing the IPR? Is this as a protective measure, the plaintiff throwing their own patent in IPR? I believe so. 
So uh, to, to answer that question, that's a different approach, uh, Scott. What, what I was saying uh, as the plaintiff, if we're sending a cease and desist letter, what we typically do, we take some scaled back approach to fortifying the patent. I would typically advise that we either throw the patent into reissue or into ex parte reexamination. Part of the reason is that those are substantially cheaper um, tools to use within the patent office. The other part is the inter partes reexamination is typically uh, initiated by a third party, not the patentee or not the patent owner. And that's the inter partes part of it is that someone on the other side of the patent would be requesting it thrown into Throw, thrown into the inter partes review. So if I'm on the offensive side, I would typically um, either contemporaneously, concurrently, or shortly after sending the cease and desist letter, um, either initiate ex parte re-exam or uh, throw the patent into reissue. One, because of cost considerations, and two, because as the patentee, as the patent owner, you can do those alone without a particular third party defendant in mind. Angela, uh, just following up on Nate's answer to that question, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Um, I, I think the, the only thing to add is just that from the patent, if you're the patent owner, I think the statute actually prevents you from filing an IPR specifically. I think it says anyone other than the patent owner can file an IPR. Um, so, you know, that's why I, uh, I think Nate's answer is good there is with respect to other options. Okay, so again, uh, Angela, as our uh, resident expert on IPRs, because that's primarily what you do, right? Yes. Okay. So have you seen the nature of IPRs change uh, from the time it was enacted until today? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of things that change. And, that, and that's one thing that's fun about, um, you know, being a board practitioner is there's always something there's always something happening. So, you know, I think there's interaction between district court cases and PTAB proceedings. That's something that's changed over the years, kind of how we look at the stays, possibility of obtaining a stay in district court versus the timing of PTAB proceedings. Um, you know, there's, I think there's a, a, a growing consensus among district courts that the point of institution is, is a key point. If the board institutes, then, you know, you're more likely to obtain a stay. Um, you know, whereas in earlier days, that wasn't as clear. Um, the other thing that's uh, changed over the past couple of years is just there's always kind of an issue of the day at the board. And really, it's like an issue of the year. But, you know, very early on, we were dealing with redundancy issues. So the board would reject, you know, your second ground in your IPR petition because the board viewed it as redundant of your first ground. And so there's a lot of thought and analysis about that. You know, of course, that's obviously changed, especially since the Supreme Court's decision in SAS Institute um, and the Federal Circuit's case law after that, which says, you know, we now institute on all claims and all grounds. And, that, and that's how it goes. Um, so that was an issue back in the day. You know, then there was a, a big, you know, a, a few years that we spent a lot of time talking about real parties and interests and the different aspects mm -hmm. of that and reviewability, whether that's reviewable at the Federal Circuit in various contexts. Supreme Court spoke on that, too, obviously. Um, and you know, I would say more recently, some of the interesting issues relate to um, the public accessibility of printed publications. I think that's a pretty hot topic these days. Um, and then of course, discretionary institution like we've kind of already discussed. So uh, Nate, are there any other hot topics that you're aware of as it, as it relates to uh, IPRs? No, honestly, I, I think Angela kind of covered all of them fairly, fairly well. Yeah, so uh, Amir, before we go on and, and look into the future of the AIA, there are a number of provisions that we haven't uh, had time to talk about. And, and some of those are track one filings, the best mode curability, uh, the s &E filings. Have you found, uh, you spoke to track one earlier. Uh, are there any other provisions that you found useful in the prosecution practice? Yeah, well, yeah, I mentioned track one earlier. That's useful. Assignee filings is useful. Um, virtual markings, I think, is um, came about, and I think it's a it's a good change. Um, you know, it's it's nice to be able to just put a, put them up on a website and put a pointer there than trying to virtually mark mark all of your products. Also, I do like that the AIA sort of quashed all of the false marking claims that you know about a decade ago was it was a pretty hot topic. 
So I, I would add, I would, I would add Mark into the list as a, as a, as a good addition. Okay. Now let's look to the, to the future of the AIA. We have a new administration. We have uh, the 10 year anniversary. We have Senator Leahy returning to the leadership of the intellectual property subcommittee of the judiciary committee. And we, we heard a lot about the Democrats Kuhn and Tillis over the last year as they sought to potentially change the reputation of the PTAB. So to go from being a patent killer to maybe one that sustains patents. But their time ran out on February 14th when Senator Leahy was announced as the, the leader of the subcommittee. So Angela, do you believe that this appointment means that we will not see meaningful AIA reform during the Biden administration? Well, you know, you never know, um, but I, I do think that what we know from the past is that Senator Leahy has certainly played a role in um, preventing, you know, certain patent reform efforts since the AIA uh, was enacted. Um, you know, of course, his his name was on the AIA, so I, I think one thing we can predict is probably any efforts to severely limit the board's um, authority, those will probably not be successful um, in the next couple of years. Um, whether there's other issues that might be amenable to, you know, uh, bipartisan efforts, um, perhaps, you know, revisions to Section 101 or some guidance there, maybe that's something um, that could have a little more traction, but um, I'm not sure it's a top priority either. So um, I think, you know, that remains to be seen. So Amir, uh, do you think that more changes like those that uh, were discussed by the former director of the PTO, namely aligning the PTAB claim construction standard with the district court, allowing PTAB judges to deny patent reviews based on the status of the district court litigation will, well, I, I guess that's more of a Nate question. Nate, do you, do you think that uh, uh, these changes will continue or do you think that uh, Andre put this out as he was leaving office and it's probably just going to sit there? Yeah, honestly, um, I don't see many of these changes happening. I, I know previously, you know, we had talked about some of the um, the changes with respect to the constitutionality of the judges. Um, that might be something that will be considered. And I know Angela knows a lot about that, that might generate some change. But as things stand right now, based on um, changes to the legislation itself, um, I don't see any any leanings or indicators to see something, we'll see something naturally come from the legislative process. There are areas that possibly could be tweaked, but um, with the current motivation and if Senator Leahy um, in his current role, I, I don't see the likely motivation to make a ton of changes. Well, let's look back to when uh, in 2011, when we were talking about the AIA and a lot of folks thought that this would help stem the tide of the so-called assertion or, or so-called weak patents that were being asserted by non-practicing entities. Do you think the AIA has served to quash that process? And by uh, that it process, has not I mean, had please. the desire. I'm sorry, Mike. Did no, I go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I, I don't think it's had the desired effect in, in its first you know, decade. Uh, just harkening back to something Amir said probably in the first 10, 20 minutes, um, I think there are other things that may have slowed, slowed down um, some of the, the weaker patents being filed, but they weren't AIA triggered. Uh, 101, you know, particularly being one of them. And then also uh, the, the change in menu, TC Heartland uh, definitely slowed down the flow, the filing of cases in the Eastern District of Texas. And then when we saw many of those cases shift to uh, the District of Delaware to Northern District of Illinois, many of them to Northern and Central California, um, they, there end up being uh, a lot of the, not of the same parties that were present in the Eastern District were showing up uh, in those venues. So it did change the tide and the flow of, of litigation filings and some of them being the quality of litigation filings, but those weren't the effect of the AIA. They were more precipitous of of um, judicial precedent that made those changes. Okay, now Amir, some people think that Senator Leahy going back into this uh, position as chair will give him an opportunity to review his America Invents Act and perhaps 
introduce some legislation that will clear up this 101 issue. Are you hopeful uh, as you look into your crystal ball that that will happen sometime soon? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to speculate if it would happen or not, but I would say, you know, there is a, a bit of unclarity as to, you know, how 101 is handled at the PTO. It's stable, but we don't know later on the cases that make it through the PTO, how, if they're litigated, how they'll be handled at the federal circuit. And anytime we can have more certainty, that would be helpful. So if, if that were to happen, that would, that would be, I think, welcome to many. Um, beyond that, there's, I think, other areas that are sort of interesting that they could, they could touch on, at least, at least from my perspective, that would be interesting, um, or pain points, maybe my wish list. Like IDSs tend to be still a huge pain point for us. And I wouldn't mind IDS is going away. You know, most of what is cited is publicly available. Most other jurisdictions don't require them. Um, it is a lot of time when you have, you know, big families and so forth to, you know, bring about that prior art that ultimately is one click away. So that's, that's a challenging area that um, creates some cumbersome processes on our end. Also, um, another area from my wish list is e-signatures. E-signatures, you know, we really saw this during COVID where everyone's home, the, the need for these type, type of um, things. And it would be nice, you know, I tend to feel like the PTO rule is a little more narrow with the rule 1.4 and the S-signature is a little bit more narrow than the federal statute. And it would be nice if it weren't, weren't as narrow. And then beyond that, you know, harmonization across the world, because yeah, an e-signature might work in one jurisdiction, but then we go to another jurisdiction like India and, the, um, you know, your typical ones like Adobe Sign and DocuSign, actually you can't use there. You have to use a local provider. And it, when you're a company that operates in a lot of jurisdictions, it, it's really hard to have one set of signature tools for one party, for one country versus another. So any harmonization there, I think would be good given the current environment, it would actually be good for the environment. Um, and I think it just, it's where we are as a, you know, as a people, I think it's actually even more secure. So mm -hmm. I think that's an area that'd be, uh, it'd be nice if they looked at. Well, Angela, I think most folks on this uh, webinar are looking at the elephant in the room. Arthrex. I always want to say anthrax, so I, I didn't <laughs> want to say that. So arthrax, uh, you know, look into your crystal ball and tell us what you think the Supreme Court's decision uh, may be and uh, what impact that could have on the on the PTAC. Yeah, so this is certainly a timely conversation because the Supreme Court will actually hear oral argument on Monday in this case. So, you know, the crystal ball will be a little bit clearer after Monday when we can, you know, listen to the judge, justices' questions and, you know, at least hear those and, you know, pretend to speculate off of that. Um, but, you know, th this is the sixth court uh, court case in 10 years uh, at the Supreme Court about the AIA. So just, you know, that's a lot for any area of law. So um, it's really fascinating that we're having another case about this at the court and another case that's, you know, potentially an existential question for the board. You know, oil states uh, was the first kind of, you know, is, is this whole system OK? And Arthrex is, is not quite as dramatic, but it, but it has some serious implications, too. So, you know, it could have. Like, like I say, it could have major implications or, or it might not, depending how the court holds. So, you know, of course, we all, the question is, you know, whether the PTAB judges are principal or inferior officers. Um, and if they're principal officers, of course, they have to be appointed um, within the bounds of the appointments clause. So, you know, the court could hold that, you know, at the end of the day, the judges are not principal officers, in which case kind of things go back to normal. Um, they could also hold that their principal officers um, and the severance that the federal circuit um, kind of crafted, which removed uh, the APJ's removal protections, um, you know, they could say that's enough and that fixed the problem. It made them inferior officers, in, in which case, you know, business as usual, sort of uh, for practitioners, but from the judge's perspective, they would still lack removal protections. Um, you know, so that's um, makes them less independent in theory, from any political changes happening at the leadership level at the office. Um, and then obviously another option that the court could take is to say that they are principal officers, 
um, but the severance doesn't fix the issue. So that could be a really sticky issue. But I think in a couple of those scenarios going forward, how this might practically uh, affect the board, um, if there is some sort of constitutional issue um, with the board structure, um, there's been a lot of ideas tossed around about how that could be fixed. So some of the ideas that I've heard um, are, you know, first of all, having the Senate confirm all of the EPJs at the board. Um, that seems a little impractical, um, but it's, you know, it's an idea. Um, another option is having the PTO director review all of the board's decisions. Um, I think that, you know, people have raised different concerns with that. Um, it's something that, you know, again, would be kind of subject to political changes potentially, um, or at least arguably. Um, and I think that the idea that seems to be gaining the most traction is a pretty serious restructuring of the board um, so that the board is actually no longer part of the patent office, uh, but instead operates as its kind of own independent agency, similar to how some other uh, boards are structured within the federal government. Um, I think that's received um, the most serious discussion, um, but you know, from the patent practitioner perspective, that would be quite the shift uh, to think of this as now totally separate from the patent office. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would be a big change. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we'll see what the court does. Uh, hopefully we'll know more on Monday. Just, you know, I encourage everyone to listen to the argument. It should be fun. And um, we'll see if it changes how things, you know, work before the board in the future. That's one thing that the pen pandemic has brought about and it's given us the ability to listen to those those arguments live. Um, Nate, if if there is some constitutional issue with the PTAB judges, do you think that will precipitate some action on behalf of uh, Congress to start to look at some of the issues that Amir mentioned that could use some some changes within the AIA? Sorry, I went on mute. Uh, I, I think it'll definitely uh, force that. I think it'll be a necessity once we see um, a question or if it's actually truly brought to question and whether the, the PTAB judges are constitutional, um, it will force Congress to take some action because we've had this tool for the last 10 years. And uh, to Angela's point, like many patent practitioners will kind of be in a quandary and trying to figure out how we move forward. We'll be looking for changes to this act to provide clarity. To that point, you know, there, there's so many other issues that could, you know, potentially go along with that. Um, clearing up issues with 101, clearing up issues with the venue laws, um, clearing up issues with the discretionary denials of institution because you're in a particular court. Uh, all of those issues hopefully will get tagged along with um, this if the constitutionality issue actually comes to bear and is brought to the door of Congress. Well, you know, if, uh, if Senator Leahy doesn't decide to uh, amend the AIA, perhaps Arthrex will do it via the Supreme Court. But I think it's safe to say that over the last 10 years, the change was not as catastrophic as some of us anticipated. Uh, so uh, it actually gave us some tools as patent practitioners to you know, advise our clients and strengthen our patent system and advise our clients as such. So Nate, thank you. Amir, thank you. Angela, I hope we made up for not asking you the pre-AIA questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Professor Robinson, that completes our our presentation, we don't have any questions in the Q&A session. I think we answered all of them as we went along. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, there is a question that just popped up. And so I think this one may be for you. Why did it take 10 years before this constitutionality got to the Supreme Court? I.e., how did this issue get to the court? Sure. Well, you know, that, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I guess it could have come up a little earlier. There were there were other challenges, like I mentioned, existential challenges to the board earlier uh, in the oil states case, you know, whether an agency could even be deciding invalidity issues or whether it needed to be in district court. So I think that was kind of the first round of, of serious challenge to the board. And so I think this was kind of a different argument that developed later over time. And of course, these things just take time to litigate, you know, a couple uh, year and a half or so before the board, year and a half, maybe at the federal circuit. So there's some time built in there as well. And patent pr practitioners are notoriously conservative, so it probably took us a while to make up our mind to challenge it. 
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are done. Professor Robinson, thank you for the invite. Thank you for putting on this program. And I think my panelists enjoyed themselves as well. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was that was terrific. Uh, thank you guys for the insights and, and taking us on that uh, temporal journey uh, through the AIA. Um, this panel worked really hard and uh, particularly given the difficulties that, that we've experienced in, in Texas uh, last week, I really appreciate uh, your hard work and your insights on the panel today. So uh, now we are going to take a, uh, a 15 minute break. Uh, we will reconvene at uh, 10.15 for our next session. <laughs>